All right, so welcome back to DNA Structure and Metabolism on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokov. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so this slide is talking about human DNA. Human DNA is what we call linear. Now, that does not in any way mean that the DNA molecule exists in a straight line. It's not straight. It's not a line. What we mean is it's not cyclic, okay, meaning... We talked about bacteria have circular chromosomes, meaning that they form a loop like a wheel. When we say it's a linear DNA molecule, it's not a straight line. It just means that one end does not physically connect to the other end. Okay. In fact, the three-dimensional structure, as we're about to talk about, is actually a lot more complicated than that. Okay. Now, in general, for what we call the arm of the chromosome, Okay, it's a giant arm. In the very center of it, somewhere, it's not at the exact center, but it divides the, the chromosome into two halves that are not equal in size. And that region is called the centromere. And the centromere is filled with a lot of repetitive DNA sequences. Um, but it divides the chromosome into two halves. One of the halves, let's just say the left side, could be the shorter arm of the chromosome. The shorter arm is given the term the P arm, and then this other side would be the longer arm, therefore, and the longer arm of the chromosome is given the Q arm. The Q arm is the longer side, and the P arm is the shorter side. Now, because the human chromosome, which is linear, is not cyclic, you have two ends, one on either side given in blue. Those ends are called telomeres. Okay, and we're just looking generally at the, at the very basic structure. We'll go into more detail on telomeres much later, but the ends are very special sequences that protect the DNA from degrade, degrading and getting shorter progressively, and those ends are called telomeres. All right, all the genes are located somewhere in these gray regions. Okay, there's no genes in the telomere, there's no genes in the centromere. All the possible genes encoded by a chromosome are all going to be in these gray regions, whether it's the P arm or the Q arm. And if the gene was in the Q arm, you would talk about that gene as Q and then some numerical designation. If the gene was in the P arm, then you refer to that gene as its location as P and then some numerical designation. Okay, and actually here are, if we look at the telomeres on either end, here are some telomere repeat sequences. So you don't just have repetitive sequences in the centromere, but also in telomeres. For example, in Homo sapiens, us, we have a telomere repeat sequence of TTAGGG, and that repeats some n number of times. And there's lots of other organisms, and depending on even the kingdom, such as plants, yeast, protozoans, they can have variations of that, okay? This right here is a very, 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 infinitely number of very simplified version of a DNA molecule, all right? In all reality, the DNA molecule is not just a straight line like this, otherwise it wouldn't fit in the nucleus. It has a much more complicated three-dimensional structure. Now, this is the video where we're going to talk extensively about supercoiling, all right? So what is supercoiling? Well, you probably, if you're watching this today, you don't really, may not even remember these phones because now, nowadays everyone uses either wireless in their house or they use a, a cell phone that's obviously wireless, but they used to have cords. And a lot of times the phone would connect through a cord that looks something like this. And if you're old enough, and I, I certainly am old enough, I remember these, the cords had loops like this that look very similar, see the coil looks very similar to the double helix of the DNA. So this is a really good representation. Now, what would happen is you would have very close to the source of the cord on either side, or the phone and then to the wall, it would be just a coil like this. But depending on um, how you stretched and bent the cord, it would form these very strange loops. Here's a great example right here. This is not just a coil. Whenever a coil loops around itself, we, it, you could call it a coiled coil, but in DNA terms, that's called a supercoil, okay? There's another supercoil like right here, and then there's some supercoils over here. And it turns out that the supercoil plays an enormous role in stabilizing the DNA and also allowing it to even fit in the nucleus. It turns out that, as we'll talk about, there are two kinds of supercoils, positive and negative. And it turns out that the DNA has to be extensively negatively supercoiled in order to even fit in the nucleus. So it plays a very important role, and it's often overlooked. And these right here, as we go from left to right, this is, by the way, a circular chromosome. So this is not a human chromosome. 
But in any case, it's the same concept. Over here, we have a completely what we will call relaxed DNA molecule, meaning it doesn't appear that it has any degree of supercoiling. Now, as we go from left to right, we're getting increased supercoiling. And what you should notice is, is notice that this DNA molecule right here takes up a lot more space than this does. So what, what it means by negatively supercoiling the DNA is we're actually packing it together more closely. By supercoiling the DNA, we pack it so closely together that it's actually able to fit in the nucleus. Now, obviously, bacteria don't have nuclei, but the concept is still the same in humans. Eukaryotes have nuclei. We supercoil our DNA in order to fit it into the nucleus. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now, what is one thing that causes supercoiling? Now, I mentioned that there's both positive and negative supercoiling. Now, before I go into this, I want to say one thing that's very important. One way to think about the difference between negative and positive supercoiling, other than, you know, physics kind of lingo, is that negative supercoiling is what we view as sort of good. Okay, negative supercoiling is what all cells, um, the nuclei of eukaryotes and just in general in prokaryotes, they use negative supercoiling to pack the DNA as close within itself as possible to reduce the volume that it takes up inside whatever compartment that the DNA exists in. The negative supercoil is also a lower energy form of the, of the DNA. DNA would much rather prefer to be in a negatively supercoiled state than a positively supercoiled state. In fact, positive supercoils from the perspective of cells is viewed as a bad thing. In fact, the cell has enzymes that we'll get into referred to as topoisomerases that actually take supercoils and relax them and ultimately try to put more negative supercoils in. So positive supercoils are higher in energy. The cell just doesn't like them. All right. Now, here's an experiment that you can do. You usually requires two people to do. You get, sort of, um, you get sort of two rubber bands is a good example. Two rubber bands or two, it could be uh, strings of yarn, whatever, and you wrap them into a, into, a, into a double helix, sort of like you would see for DNA, okay? Then one person, this person on the left, is gonna hold their two strands statically, hold them tightly. The person on the other side, the right side in this case, is gonna take the two strands with both of their hands and start breaking them apart, all right? When this person starts to break them apart, what you will see is that you'll start inducing supercoils, as you can see, these are supercoils, four of them, ahead of wherever you're pulling the strands apart. So if I'm pulling the strands apart here, I'm inducing supercoils ahead of where I'm pulling them apart, okay? This analogy is really good because it turns out that when we start replicating DNA, as we do in DNA replication, and this is done by the DNA polymerase complex, and then in transcription by RNA polymerase, we have to break the DNA strands apart to perform those reactions. So when we replicate DNA, there, there is what we call a replication bubble or a replication fork, and what we have to do is break the strands apart, but what that's gonna do when we break the strands apart is induce positive supercoils ahead of the DNA strand, ahead of wherever we're breaking them apart, okay? So whenever we break strands apart in biochemistry in the cell, we induce positive supercoils ahead of the DNA strand, okay? And that's not a good thing, okay? We're actually gonna see that we're gonna have ways to relax those positive supercoils okay, and get rid of them. But whenever we pull two strands apart, we induce supercoiling, all right? Now, supercoiling is induced mainly in, and I know I say positive supercoiling, is induced mainly by strand separation, usually when we're doing things like transcription or DNA replication, as we'll get into. And we have enzymes that deal with that positive supercoiling and relax it back down into a more negatively supercoiled state. But the degree of supercoiling in part can be quantified by something that we call a linking number. Now, in general, what a what linking number is, is it's the number of times, it's the number of times that two DNA molecules in this case, um, remember, because we have two strands, so they are technically separate molecules, okay? But two strands, however many times the strands cross over each other. So you can see right here, here's one point where they cross over each other. Therefore, the linking number is one, okay? And in general, that crossover, wherever you count a second crossover, it has to be identical to, in terms of the, um, 
in terms of the, the geometry, it has to be identical to the first crossover. So for example, this one has a linking number of six. So if I count this one as the point of crossover, this right here would not be a crossover because this is crossing from this side and then the other straight is crossing over from the other side. So this would be one, okay? This one has more links and it has more points of crossing over. This one has a linking number of six, all right? Now, it turns out that a long time ago, a scientist named Gauss developed an equation to show what the linking number is for two strands that cross over each other. So we're not obviously going to be using this long uh, mathematical algorithm to calculate linking number. We're going to simplify it ultimately to this expression down here. So it turns out the linking number of a DNA molecule is equal to the twists plus the writhe. Okay, so TW is the twist, WR is the writhe. Okay, now what is twist? Twist, and let me see if I can find a good example of this. Like I said before, we look at the number of times that the DNA molecule, when it's wrapping around itself, it crosses over at a particular geometry. Well, if you were to start here as this is the first twist and go all the way around this DNA molecule, you would find it crosses over apparently 36 times. Okay, therefore its twist is 36, but it has no writhe. What is writhe? Writhe is when, not when you have these little twists that you see here, but when you have the entire coil coiling around itself. So look at this. This is one area of writhe, a second area, a third writhe, and a fourth writhe. Okay, so it turns out that writhe is what produces supercoiling. Twists do not count as supercoiling for what we're going to be talking about. Only writhe counts for supercoiling, okay? And in general, when we have negative supercoiling, that gives us a negative value for writhe. If we were to have positive supercoiling, it would be a positive value for writhe. But what we do to calculate the linking numbers, we take the twists, the number of times the little individual strands cross over each other, and then we count the number of writhes, Okay, and that's the times the entire DNA molecule, the entire coil wraps around itself. If it's negative supercoils, then it's a writhe that's negative. If the supercoiling was positive, then the writhe would be positive, and we just add them. So here the linking number is 32. Okay, and in general, the lower the linking number is, the more relaxed the DNA molecule is. Okay, the lower the linking number, the more relaxed the DNA molecule is. Okay, the more stable it is. And it turns out that an enzyme called a topoisomerase can induce negative supercoils, which relaxes the DNA. So, so the more negative supercoiling we have, the more relaxed it is. So this would be a more relaxed version of this DNA molecule right here. They are topoisomers. They are the same DNA molecule. However, they have different topologies or different three-dimensional structures. Okay, this one is supercoiled, and this one is not. Okay, so... When we're looking at supercoiling, we can have positive or negative. Now, whenever we have positive versus negative supercoiling, let's actually go to negative first. This is the one that relaxes the DNA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to eyeball one part of the DNA molecule, just about right here. I'm going to eyeball it about right there. Okay. And I'm going to stick my right hand, hold out my right hand with my thumb pointing straight up. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to curl my fingers in the natural way that they curl. And if the DNA molecule wraps around in that way, so if I look, it's sort of wrapping around like this, and sure enough, that is exactly the way that my right hand curls, then it's negatively supercoiling. So in other words, if the coiling, the supercoiling follows the right hand rule, it's negative supercoiling. That's why we say this is right-handed coiling. Okay, if it's positively supercoiled, then you ought to be able to do the same thing with your left hand if it's positive supercoiling. So this is sort of the left hand rule, I guess you could say. So you can eyeball one part of the DNA, and all you do is you stick out your left hand, have your thumb pointed up, and you curl your fingers in the direction that they naturally would, and sure enough, you see that it curls in a left-handed fashion, so that's positively supercoiling. Okay. So again, with negatively, negative supercoiling, 
um, the more negative supercoils we have, the lower the writhe is. So we have negative one here again in this print, negative two is two supercoils, negative three is three supercoils. And that tends to decrease the linking number. All right, if we have positive supercoils, these are, these are left-handed supercoils, and we can have a writhe of positive one, writhe of positive two, writhe of positive three, okay? And those all tend to increase the energy and instability and it's unfavorable for it to be possibly supercoiled, we're going to have to have enzymes to relax these. What are some ways we can look at more, more in detail at these? Well, here is a DNA molecule, and we're just defining it to have a linking number of 200. All right? So here we, de we change the linking number by negative 2. An example of something that can do this is a type 2 topoisomerase. Topoisomerases induce negative supercoils, so what they do is they drop the writhe by 2, meaning they... They, have a, they change the writhe by negative 2, which also changes the linking number by negative 2, since they don't affect twist. And remember, since linking number is twist plus writhe, if you have a linking number of 200 initially and one reaction of a type 2 topoisomerase, which changes the linking number by minus 2 by decreasing the writhe by 2, then you end up with a linking number of 198. That's because you relax the linking number by two by introducing essentially two units of writhe, and that's negative writhe because it's negative supercoils. If you ever break the DNA strand in terms of circular DNA, if you break the DNA strand with a nick, now the linking number is undefined. Okay, you can never talk about linking number when the strands are not completely cyclic. If you break the strand, it's no longer defined. Now here's the same DNA strand. We're defining this linking number to be 200. If you were to change the linking number by minus 2, meaning I, t I add a writhe of negative 2, then because linking number is twist plus writhe, 200 minus 2 is 198. This is introduction of negative supercoils. Okay? Now, if I change the linking number by positive 2, meaning for whatever reason I add positive units of writhe, 2, then I, now I have more positively supercoiled with a linking number of 202. And like I said, negative supercoils are more favorable in the cell than positive, so a lower linking number is more favorable from the cell's perspective. And a little bit more about supercoiling, all right? We have two kinds, solenoidal and plectinemic. So you've probably seen a solenoid like this before. This is where you have a loop literally looping around itself. Now it turns out that the way supercoils form naturally is with solenoidal. Okay, solenoidal is how they naturally form, um, and that's because we have a large writhe. Remember, writhe introduces supercoils, because writhe is what causes supercoils. So if we have a large writhe, this is sort of what happens. That's called solenoidal supercoiling. There is another way to change the linking number, and that's by introducing large amounts of twist. So notice we're not actually introducing writhe. We're not actually introducing te the technical form of supercoiling here. We're actually just twisting it up more and more. So you've probably done this whenever you have a, a rag that you've, it's completely saturated with water, like you've been washing something, and you hold the rag out and you just twist it to wring the water out. That's an example of plectinemic supercoiling. That's what you do when you're trying to wring the water out, maybe when you're washing a car or something. Okay, That also changes the linking number. However, this is not the natural way it occurs in cells. The way it naturally occurs is solenoidal, and that's what we'll be focusing on. Okay. Also notice plectinemic supercoiling does not introduce any writhe, okay, whether it's positive or negative. All right. And just kind of one more thing here that's really important. Um, whenever we unwind the DNA, so if we unwind it, you know, some, for whatever reason, sometimes it can happen whenever we're pulling apart the DNA due to um, replication or transcription. Other, other times we can actually just simply heat the DNA enough to where it comes apart. That occurs in the lab. If this, if, we, if wherever we um, underwind the DNA or unwind it, it's a palindromic sequence, we can actually form something called a cruciform DNA, okay, which is not, not very common because it's not as common that we have a palindromic sequence. But if it does happen in a place that we have um, unwinding of DNA where we have palindromic sequences, then we get cruciform structures that form like this. All right. 
Now that's enough on supercoiling for this video. In the next video, we're gonna talk about how supercoiling affects things in the lab. So for example, when we electrophorese DNA in an agarose electrophoresis experiment, we'll see that relaxed DNA actually does not travel as far through the gel. Um, it travels much more slowly than highly supercoiled DNA. And we'll talk about the implications of that in the next video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.